grace and peace be multiplied to you from God the Father and of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Demar, it's good to see you, O'Shane. Our scripture reading this morning is from St. Matthew chapter 24. Sorry, St. Matthew chapter 14. And I'll just read from verse 25 to 27. That's St. Matthew chapter 14, verse 25 goes like this. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, be not afraid. Let us pray. Father and our God, we are so thankful for this moment. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will bless us as we listen to your word. Let this word find lodgment in our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk and teach under the title, He's Right There With You. He's Right There With You. The Sea of Galilee, also known as Lake Gennesaret, or the Sea of Tiberias, was a popular lake in Jesus' time. Its popularity grew for many reasons, but especially for its unique geographic location. Often scholars refer to this sea as the cradle of the gospel because of the numerous biblical events that pivot around this location. However, regardless of these facts that the Sea of Galilee is Israel's largest body of drinking water, and despite the fact that the lake is used even to this day as recreation and for tourism, there is something else you need to know about the Lake Gennesaret. It is surprisingly unpredictable. It is known for storm. And not just any storms, Carol, but violent storms. The lake lies 680 feet below sea level and it is bounded by hills, especially on the eastern side, where they reach a height of 2,000 feet. These heights are a source of cool and dry air. So the mountainous hill form a funnel for the wind, resulting in strong winds dropping to the sea. Thus, at any time, there could be a storm. Imagine with me, if you will, you're out there on the Sea of Galilee, just a normal day. You're going about your everyday living. And just before you know it, Ross, you're in a storm. Everything could be going perfectly right. The sun is at its zenith. The breeze is blowing briskly. When all of a sudden you find yourself in a storm. You know, it's kind of like life. You're here at the seminary. You believe God called you to the gospel ministry. And you work so hard on campus. $8.50. And you buy yourself a brand new bicycle from neighbor to neighbor, I mean from Walmart. And you park it outside of the library just to return a book. And upon return, some brave soul gone with your bicycle. And just before you know it, you're in a storm. You have been working there for 10 years. The boss call you in for what you thought was a promotion. But then you leave with a pink slip. And just before you know it, you're in a storm. And if it's not you, it could be a loved one. They went to the doctor just for a regular checkup. And they came back with cancer. And just before you know it, you're in a storm. Storms are no respecters of persons. As a matter of fact, these disciples were in the will of God. Dr. Hutz, when they found themselves in a storm, they didn't get in this boat by their own volition. They were being obedient to Jesus Christ. And sometimes being obedient to God is the impetus of a storm. I'd like to posit the possibility to you right now today that each and every one of us finds ourselves in either one of three situations, Shane. 
either you're coming out of a storm, you're heading towards a storm, or you're currently in a storm. What do you do when you find yourself in the storms of life? How do you handle the rough reality of not being able to have the promotion and the progression that you wish you would have in such a time as this? What you need to be reminded of is that it was Jesus who said to you, let us go over on the other side. The Bible says that Jesus came walking to them on the water in the fourth watch of the night. So this is a time between 3 a.m. to daybreak. At this time, the disciples, they, they had already come to their extremity of self-reliance. The Gospel of Mark said that they were straining. John said that it was dark and they were rowing hard. Matthew said that they were being beaten by the waves. The wind was so turbulent, Carol, that they could not see Jesus. The waves were so terrible that they could not hear Jesus. But the storm was strong enough that Jesus couldn't see them. In other words, sometimes the storms of life will prevent you from seeing Jesus. But it's not preventing Jesus from seeing you. So let me do some practical preaching right here. You see, the first watch of your life, Aaron, is when you say to yourself, I've got this. I can handle this. But then things got worse. So, so you enter the second watch where you heat up your brethren. Yeah. But, but, but then you can't get through to him. Things got even worse. Mm -hmm. the, the, the third watch is when you say to yourself, man, I need to go to Pioneer Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church. I need to find Pastor Dwight Nelson so he can lay his hands on me. Yeah. When you reach the PMC, Pastor Nelson is out of town. And this is when you've tried everything. Yeah humanly possible and it's failed and it's in moments like this that Jesus said you have tried everything you have tried everyone why don't you try me it's in moments like this to him is right father I stretch my hands to thee no other help I know if thou withdraw thyself from me ah whither shall I go the psalmist said in thee O Lord do I put my trust? Yeah. David said, I cried unto the Lord yeah. with my voice. And he heard me out of his holy hills. Yeah. You need to remember that it was Jesus who said, let's go over on the other side. Yeah. You see, Jesus at times will wait, Carl, until we come to our extremity. So that he can step in with an opportunity. Because if, if, if Jesus had come too early, sometimes we'd pat ourselves on the back. It says, me, but got this. But Jesus will wait until we have exhausted all our human resources. So the first thing that the text teaches us is that we need to see his sovereignty in our situation. Imagine with me if you will. Jesus was coming to help them. But they saw help as hurt. Notice verse 26. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Jesus was coming to help them, but they saw help as harm. And the reason for this, Dr. Williams, it was based on their perception of the situation. Sometimes, Sabian, your assessment of your situation, the assessment of your reality can cause you to have a certain outlook. And depending on your outlook, whether you have an uplook or a downlook, yeah. will allow you to respond in a certain way. John Maxwell in his book, The Winning Attitude, said that two men, they were shoemakers. They were in England, and they went to India to establish a branch location. The first shoemaker went there, and he was shocked with the sad scene. Nobody there, Tina, wear shoes. And he was disappointed. And so he went back to England. The second shoemaker came on the scene and he saw the same rough reality that no one there wears shoes. But he wrote back a telegram to management and said, listen, no one here wears shoes, so you need to send 10,000 shoes. Because we can have a big blowout sale. In other words, same situation, but different perfection. 
And this is the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is this, Adrian. Nothing in life catches God by surprise. No storms that we encounter catches God by surprise. Even those storms which are caused by the enemy. And Brian, if it didn't catch God by surprise, it means that he allowed it. And if God allowed it, it means that he's going to help me get through it. And if he's going to help me get through it, it means that he's not done with me yet. And if he's not done with me yet, that's something to shout about. And if I can shout about this, it's probably because I'm not seeing his sovereign situation, his sovereignty in my situation. So watch the text. They were being tossed to and fro. Back and forth by the boisterous wind and the wave. And then Jesus came walking to them on the water. Somebody missed that. The very thing that was tossing them to and fro, back and front. Jesus came walking on it. In other words, he had it, Akim, under his feet. He had it under control, though it seemed as if. It was out of control. So Peter went walking on the water. And Ross, yes, he sank because he took his eyes off Jesus. But you know, I like Peter because at least he stepped out of the boat. At least he have a testimony of what it's like to walk on water, Brian. When Peter went back to the boat, he's the only one who can say, I know what it's like to walk on water. But you know, the second thing that the text teaches us is that you must trust what he say over what you see. Notice verse 28. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me, bids me to come on the water. So in essence, the text is telling us that Peter didn't really went out on the word, you know, Michael, on the water, you know. He went out on the word because... If he wanted, he could have walked on the water without saying, Lord, if it is you. But Peter, no, humanly, you can't walk on water. Peter said, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come unto you. And Jesus gave him a word. While Peter was in this moment of storm, Jesus, Dr. Huss, gave him a word. And at the end of the day, that's what makes all the difference. When you get a word. Come on. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So it doesn't matter how dark, dismal, or depressing your storm is. Once you have a word, it makes all the difference. In your storm. You, you may lose everything, Ross. But once you have a, a word, it makes all the difference. You, you, you might lose your honey and your money. But once you have a word, it makes all the difference. No matter what the storms of life are, there's always a word that you can walk on. And somebody's saying, preacher, my storm... Is loneliness. Is there a word? Matthew 28 verse 20 said, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of time. Somebody saying, Carvel, you don't understand. My storm is weariness. Matthew 11 verse 28 said, Come unto me, all ye that labored and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Somebody saying, Preacher, you don't understand. My storm is enemy. Isaiah 54 verse 17 said that no weapon. That form against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rise up against you in the judgment will be condemned. Somebody say, preacher, you don't understand. My storm is sinful habits and practices. Jude 24 said, now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter how rough the sea of life gets at time. There is. A word. And so when we are in our storms and we are wondering, where is Jesus? I'm just here today to let you know that he's right there with you. 
you must see his sovereignty in your situation. You must trust what he says over what you see. And I appeal to you today, I don't know the storm you're in, but I do believe that there is a word. And if you want to claim that word, that promise, why don't you stand with me as I pray? Father, we thank you for your word. And we believe that your word is living, it's powerful, it's active. And just as our faces differ, so do our situation. So through the power of your Holy Spirit, impress that word on each heart due to the different storms that we're going through so that we can rest assured that in our storms, you're there with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.